and we're live. Good evening, everybody. How are you? I hope you're well. As you can see, I'm wearing a jumper. It's bloody cold here tonight in England. Welcome, people. Joining slowly, one by one, two, three, four. You'll all get here eventually. Don't worry. We're going to be here for the next hour or so. I've just been outside and undertaken my my clapping for our frontline NHS workers. Thank you to them and to everybody else on the front line. Uh, people working in supermarkets, people who are driving our buses, people who are taking away our rubbish, everybody who is putting in a shift. Um, we salute you and thank you all. So I can see you're coming in in your dribs and drabs. I hope you're well. The weather's changed a little bit. Obviously, we're British, so we have to talk about the weather. Although this is open to anybody elsewhere in the world. I hope the weather is better with you. It's been very cold here the last couple of days. But we've had some pretty good weather over the last few months, uh, the last few weeks. So anyway, I'm talking about the weather. Welcome to this Ciderologist Taste Along session in conjunction with Crafty Nectar. I'm Gabe Cook, I am the Ciderologist, uh, and if you don't know me, then you will do by the end of tonight, uh, to uh, an extent anyway. Evening, Steve Bentley. Um, I've got, I can see, if I look very clear, uh, carefully, uh, hi Joe, um, comments and things, so I'll endeavour to, uh, to pick up on, uh, on questions as, uh, as they come on through. Um, now, the whole premise of this evening is around, it's called a taste along because, you know, it's one of those that does what it says on the tin. You're going to be tasting things at the same time that I'm going to be tasting things. We are going to taste along together, in fact. And, um, but the tasting is only going to be part of the component. There's obviously a lot of talking that needs to be done, primarily by me, but you're able to ask questions too. So, you know, we're here in this environment because this is something that we would either do down the pub um, or maybe like there'd be a tasting session and we'd be doing this face to face. And obviously with the COVID-19, we are not able to do that. So this is another part of number of talks and tastings that are happening online at the moment by various people. Um, and I'm certainly getting into my online tasting groove um, by doing all, all of these kinds of things. But hi, Helen Jones from the Isle of Wight. Not sure if there's any cider makers in the Isle of Wight. Please tell me if there are. I'd love to try one. Um, and so normally what happens with these tastings for me uh, is that I'm not, it's normally just me chatting or chatting with somebody, but being a bit sporadic as to what I'm drinking. And the feedback unanimously is always, what are you drinking so that we can drink along with you? So I approached my good friends, uh, Crafty Nectar, uh, one of the UK's finest cider merchants and distributors um, to see if they could provide a box, this curated cider box, um, to go out to people purchase so you can taste uh, along at the exact same time with the ciders that I'm tasting. And I think that, hi Helen Jones, hi, um, oh, Gray's Knee Cider Isla White, nice. Uh, Gemma Crow from Yorkshire, Rito. Um, Kerry from Hereford, good to see you all. So, yeah, this, this is all about, you know, you tasting along at the same time. And I believe many, many people uh, have purchased this box. So thank you very much. Much appreciated. But anybody's able to participate. This is in a free and open space. So if anybody has to hand, as it happens, Harry's Dry Original, Bushel Peck Slow and Easy, or the mighty Hallett's Real Cider, um, have them to hand because we're, we're going to be tasting these three tonight and so that you can uh, you can taste along with. So yeah, Ciderologist, who am I? What do I do? I suspect that a lot of you uh, might know who I am just because I'm very loud and I've got quite a distinguishable facial feature. My nose is very, very pretty. I know. Uh, it's renowned throughout uh, the Seven Kingdoms. I've been watching a lot of Game of Thrones at the moment. What else are you going to do in lockdown? Um, and yeah, it's my job to talk about cider because I made up my own job, basically. Uh, I've worked in the cider industry for nearly 15 years now. Drinking cider, making cider, talking about cider, advocating cider, tiny little cider farms, all the way up to the world's largest. Um, UK, lived in New Zealand for a while, made cider, made wine. 
but decided to come back to the UK. Sometimes I wonder why that was such a good idea. New Zealand's a pretty cool place to be, but I came back because I really wanted to endeavour to have a go at being this ciderologist, somebody who is a champion for cider. Because, you know, it'd be fair to say that cider doesn't always have the best kind of reputation. I'll come on to that in a minute. So I come from a little village called Dimmock. You'll hear about Dimmock quite a few times tonight because I'm very, very passionate about the beautiful little village that I'm from. I think my dad's watching, my dad and mum, um, who, uh, who obviously brought me up in this wonderful little, little village. And it's got a proud, strong cider heritage, uh, loads, of, uh, loads of old orchards around, cider apples, peri pears, and just grew up with it. And it really, really inspired me. Um, and this is what continues to inspire me today. It's the wonderful culture and heritage of cider making, sort of in the old world, not just UK, not just West Country, but in Northern Spain, Northern France, everywhere else. Um, but also it's this new world of cider making uh, that I love as well, exploring where cider can be made. And I will be talking several times this evening about the world's biggest cider tasting session, Saturday, 8 p.m., my Instagram channel. Tune in. It's going to be manic, I think is the best word to describe it. Anyway. So, the culmination of all of my cider endeavours are A, uh, a t-shirt, and B, gratuitous plug number one, I wrote a book, and it's called Ciderology. If you're going to be called a ciderologist, you're going to do a book called Ciderology, aren't you? Or aren't I? Well, yeah, I did. So, please buy it, I think. You know, uh, corona times are tough. I've lost a lot of work. Don't feel too sorry for me. I'm okay. Still eating, still drinking. Lovely girlfriends living with me. We're all good. We're happy. We're healthy. There are lots of people who are in bad conditions. But, you know, a book sale here and there just helps to, you know, with the baked beans on toast every now and again. So I think we'll find it maybe a riveting read. If you haven't already got it, um, so please do buy it. Anyway, you're here to drink cider. And I'm certainly here to drink cider too. But I'm, I'm going to talk to you for just a couple more minutes. Lots of people, uh, lots of <laughs> people tuning in. My dad, yes. Brung you up proper like. Thanks, Dad. You're from you're from Yorkshire. You're not even from Gloucester. That was Mum. Anyway, uh, we've got Harrods uh, from the Basque Country. We've got Eduardo from Asturias. We've got Mike from Bristol. Ah, Sven Jalslinde. God tag from Sogndal in Norway. Tusen tak. Thanks for tuning in. We've got loads of uh, loads of people watching. This is great. This is the joy of cider. Is this new global world? But today. We're pairing it back to the UK just to bring it back down because, you know, as much as I do quite frequently champion and celebrate cider from all around the world, because that is something that I do find fascinating. Maybe sometimes I don't always give full attention to the amazing um, ciders that we have being made here in the UK. So that's what tonight's focus is going to be on. Karuna and Rich, lovely to see you too. Thanks for, thanks for dialing in. Bristol represent. So, you know, some of you might have heard this from me before in previous talks, but I'm going to do it anyway, just in case anybody hasn't, because it is really, really, um, it is really, really uh, important to talk about this. That it's around, it's around styles of cider. How do we get these different types of cider or styles of cider? Because there are loads of different types. It's just that they don't always get recognised with beer and wine. Um, there are loads and loads of different cider. Okay, people are already complaining that they're thirsty. So what a fair shout. Let's open up. Side number one is going to be the Harry's. Dry, open it up, pour it. Let's have something in our palates because you're right, you're, you're going to get angry with me otherwise. I will come back and talk about this in a minute, but first of all, pour. Cheers to you all. Wassail, as we would say in the uh, English cider country. Behold, good health, wassail, cheers. However, you want to say it. Estonian, tarvazex, you know, German, post, sante, slancher, whatever, whatever you, you fancy. Cheers to you all. Oh, that's a good drink. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I was talking about styles. Styles of wine, wine varietals, styles of beer. You go into the pub and it's amazing. Never has there been a better time to be a drinker in this country. Um, the range and selection of, of drinks that are available are just fantastic. My hair's really fluffy, isn't it? Look at that. Not that I'm vain at all. My girlfriend did a really good job on the cut, by the way. Cheers, Jules. Um, and um, uh, I've distracted myself. Oh, oh yeah, stars. Go to the pub, and it's the most amazing selection of cider, uh, drinks that there are today. If you're a drinker, never has it been a better time. You've got, you know, you go to the pub and you've got the lagers on tap, and you've got some great handfuls. You've got a bitter, a best bitter, you've got a pale ale, maybe a porter, maybe a stout, and then you've got the range of other beers. You've got a double IPA and a Saison and a Berliner Weisse and a whatever. 
And then with the wines, you've got, you know, in the fridge, you've got the Chardonnay and the Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc or the Chilean Sauvignon Blanc, maybe a Pitbull de Pinay or whatever. In the reds, you've got your Argentinian Malbec, you've got your, uh, you've got your Burgundy or you've got a Bordeaux and whatever it is. And then you've got the cider. Just one cider because cider is just one thing, isn't it? Or that at least is how it is considered by lots and lots of people. Important people as well, like people who buy and sell drinks think of cider as a singular thing. And come on, people, we know that it's not. There is a wonderful wealth and breadth range of different types and styles of cider out there. How and why? Well, the primary first factor is the fact that you need to consider that cider is made like wine. You make wine, you make cider, you don't brew cider like you brew beer. Although cider very often is presented a bit more like beer, Carbonated, single serve bottle, maybe even on tap, um, similar alcohol. It's a fruit fermentation. You make it like a wine. You get the fruit, you squeeze it, you extract the juice. Juice is full of sugar. Yeast turns sugar into alcohol. You have, um, you've got your cider, or indeed your wine, and it is ostensibly the exact same kind of thing. So your choice of your apple varietal, like your choice of your grape varietal, is the number one most important thing. And that's what helps provide broad differentiation between ciders when we start to kick off. Now here, where I am sat in the west of England, and sort of where I grew up in the broader area in the west of England, there is a culture of making cider that goes back a thousand years based upon the utilization of specific varieties of apples that have been grown for the sole purpose of making cider. They are called cider apples. Up here for thinking, down there for dancing, as we would say around here, smart folk out west. They are cider apples. They're generally not for eating because they contain a property called tannin. Tannin is like what you get in a red wine, tea or coffee, boldness, richness, mouthfeel, complexity, all sorts of different characters we'll talk about in a moment. Specific varieties specifically grown for cider. And that's what the yeah, sort of the West Country in a broader geography, there's plenty of debate as to West Country is the, the correct name or terminology or not. We're so very we're so very early in the journey of trying to give names and tags to different things. Um, so this is what we're going to talk to. Tonight's theme is same, same, but different. So we've got three ciders. So if everybody's got your uh, got your crafty nectar box, again, thank you so much for purchasing. Good on you for participating. This is great. Um, I hope you're going to have a good time. Uh-oh, I've finished my first one already, Mike Shawland. Well, you're obviously very, very thirsty. Um, tonight, like I say, we, uh, you've got the box contains six products. We're going to drink three tonight and three tomorrow night. It didn't seem such a good idea to like sort of rush through and drink them all in one sitting. Uh, and it might get a little bit, I might, you know, I could barely speak at the best of times, let alone after six bottles of cider. So tonight we're going to be drinking three. As I said, the Harry's Dry, which we've just opened, I'm just about to talk about now, the Bushland Peck, slow and easy, and the Hallets. If I were you, I would take those out of the fridge now. I personally wouldn't want to drink those too cold for reasons that we can talk about um, in a moment. So let's focus on side number one, and it is Harry's original, the original dry cider, dry and sparkling. So what do we want to know about this? Well, Harry's, uh, Harry Fry, he's based, um, He's based in Somerset, in southern Somerset, just outside Langport, uh, which is a you know an absolute cornerstone of West Country cider making, um, and it's uh, you know he, he's one of the great cider makers that has come through over the course of the last ten years. His family's been in that region for five generations. Um, they utilised fruit from a, an orchard that was originally planted forty odd years ago uh, to supply fruit to. Um, to a larger cider maker, I presume that might be um, Charing's, let's say. I've got a bit of blurb from everybody because obviously there's way more than I can um, remind myself. And the orchard has got a blend of different varieties. They do they do different ciders. Um, Harry Reid, the first to admit, he likes to keep things sort of relatively simple. So this cider is a blend of Dabinet and of Browns. Now Dabinet is one of those classic West Country cider apple varieties, a classic Somerset cider apple variety. You know, you, you, you did, they're, they're, not, they're not for eating. Uh, you won't never see anything like that in a supermarket. But it's a good cropper, big and bold of tannin, very popular by smaller cider makers and larger cider makers alike. Um, and what's awesome, and this is where I love cider and I love the regionality of it. And when again, if we were in, 
if we were in Italy or if we were in France and there was a variety of something that was originated close to somewhere, you would champion it from the hilt. So check this out. I'm just going to read the blurb here. Hang on. Um, da, 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 we, the Dabinet variety was originally developed four miles from where they make the cider. And Mr. Dabinet's great grandson, who lives locally, frequently returns to purchase the single variety Dabinet cider that they make. How awesome is that? In the cider world, inside of Bubble, Dabinet is, you know, heralded as one of the kings uh, of, of apple varieties. And so imagine that, that the great grandson of, of the founder, the, far, the farmer who found the gribble, who found the little, uh, the little seedling, um, still comes. That, that, that would mean everything to me. That is pure history, and that's amazing. Anyway, we digress. Let's talk about the cider. So Dabinet will provide bold and tannin. But sometimes, some people would say, classically, most ciders, historically and today, are blends of different apple varieties. So you can get a range of different kind of characters. It's not to say you can't do single varieties. Tune in tomorrow and we will be tasting one. Um, so this is a blend of two. We've got that bold tannin of the, um, we've got the tannin of the, um, of the Dabinet. But they've also put some browns in there. Now browns, is a, it's, a, it's a Devon apple, it's about 100 years old, uh, and it provides some acidity, very light. Kind of tannin. Anyway, talk, 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 talk. Let's have a go. Give it a swirl. We can talk glassware another time. There is no specified side of glassware. I've gone for like a sort of bigger stemmed glass. I think just so I could get it down my gullet probably the most quickly because it's such a good cider. Color point of view, it's a bit. It's so dark tonight. Like it's normally really, really light in here, but it's got some really dark, um, sort of almost pale amber kind of color. That's because of the tannins providing that coloration. Give it a swirl. Get your nose in there. Don't spill it all over the tablecloth like I normally do. And have a go. A couple of short sniffs and then the distant, the long sniff. Very nice. So, I'm getting some slightly sort of caramelly tones on there. Maybe some like sort of roasted hazelnut kind of things. A little bit of smokiness, a little bit of earthiness, a little bit of spiciness. These are all classic of what we call volatile phenolics, people. And these are associated with the tannins. They're not... Classically, they're not tannins. They're kinds of polyphenols. Tannins are polyphenol. Volatile phenolics are polyphenols. Science, don't worry about it. You don't need to. Just know that this is a bold, rich smell, and it's exactly what we'd expect from a classic kind of Somerset style cider. Cheers to you. Let's have a taste. What do we get? Boom. Three key components in here. Number one, at the front, there is a tiny little bit of freshness and zinginess. That is called acidity, um, sharpness if you want. Only a very little bit. And that comes from this brown apple. It just helps provide a little bit of balance, a little bit of life against what comes next, which is whoosh, the body, the breadth of these tannins. It's doing three things. It's like going like three dimensional in your mouth in terms of all the corners and the spaces that it's filling. It's providing a little bit of spicy, um, a little bit of spicy bitterness. Imagine like a bit of woody, a bit of quinine bitterness on there. But most importantly, astringency. That mouth drying sensation that you're getting. These are all from the tannins. The apple variety you use, or the apple varieties that you use, these give you the primary flavor profiles. There's a question as whether it's the brands that gives the sharp juicy note, um, the juicy note comes from, finish comes from. Uh, yes, there is also, I think, a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of sugar in there. Only a tiny bit. Almost negligible and probably not particularly well noticed um, to a lot of people because of the intensity, the acidity and the astringency are both drying your palate out. So it is dry. I would say it's perfectly fine to call this a dry cider. Is, is it bone dry as in zero sugar? I don't think so. But this is all where it comes down to personal Opinion, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to try three very different ciders tonight and three very different ones tomorrow. I have the confidence as the world's foremost, stroke only, independent cider advocate that these are all great ciders and great exponents of their individual style. Whether you like them or not, well, that's up to you. And this is where it comes down to understanding how you get this different sort of stylization. You don't have to like every single style of wine. I suspect some of you may do because you might like a drop and that's fine too. But you might like a Sauvignon Blanc. You might like a Sauvignon Blanc, but you might not like a Malbec, or vice versa. You might like a nice, crisp, 
fresh, uh, super attenuated Saison, um, and you, but you might not like a big, rich, malty porter. That's not to say that either of those styles are, are inferior in any way. It's just understanding what you like and what you enjoy. We've got a really international contingent tonight. I'm loving this. Mr. Plume from uh, Latvia, Maris, good evening. Love Dabinet, we are happy it's fruiting in our orchard. You see, there is Dabinet in Latvia. Have we got some friends from Romania watching this evening? Luca, good to see you, thank you for joining in. So I would say that this is, this is the epitome of a, of a fairly sort of classic style of, of West Country. Not all of these West Country ciders have that acidity. That's coming from this brands. The majority of these West Country ciders, these tannic apples, they're called bittersweets, higher the tannin, lower of acidity. Some people find them a bit unbalanced because you've just got the tannin, nothing to provide a little bit of freshness in there. Again, personal choice in terms of what the cider maker desires and the personal choice of you as the consumer is what you enjoy. Most important for me is giving the consumer, the drinker, you the opportunity to try this wonderful range and breadth of different ciders or indeed cidre. Uh, bonsoir. Uh, Arno, good to see you. Um, and yeah, it's just about celebrating that joy of this wonderful wealth and breadth of different types of cider. Um, it'd be useful for me to say at this point that the caramel, uh, Virginia, the caramel is noticeable. Yeah, I think that, that there is definitely some sort of toasty caramel notes um, up on the aromatics, especially a little bit less so in the in the palate. But it's just enough. It's just. It's just soft and smooth and very palatable. Some people, dry, here we go, let's talk about dry. Virtually every single cider in the world will start its life as a bone dry still cider. Did you know that? Fact of the day. Why? Because all of the sugar that's contained within apples will get converted to, um, to, to alcohol by yeast under normal conditions. And the amount of sugar that there is contained within the apples is, is of a relatively, relatively low proportion such that that yeast, it will just chomp through and it will stop, it'll only stop fermenting when all the sugar's gone. Virtually every single cider around the world will start its life as a bone dry cider. Cider often gets a reputation of being, oh, it's just a very sweet cider, isn't it? That's it's fair because a lot of the ciders around the world are presented as being quite sweet. A lot of them will have uh, either juice or sugar added back to it. Now again, I'm not saying that's bad or a wrong thing, it's just a fact. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. If you want to present a bone dry cider, you can. It's just that a lot of consumers, I think, are scared of the word dry. But also that societally we've become a little bit more akin to having um, a bit more sugar in our in our palate, and our portfolio, um, and to have things that are a bit more bold and if not um, a challenging a character but certainly they don't have the sweetness but you can have fruitiness and intensity and balance without having a huge amount of sugar and this cider is um is a perfect example of that i would say um lots of cider makers watching this evening this is wonderful hello and thank you to you all um i'm gonna have another little little taste of this and then we're gonna get on to cider number two so um, but you know what, I'm gonna have a little bit more. Ali Skiff says, does toasted caramel come from pasteurization? Possibly. So for anybody, pasteurization is a process of stabilizing, um, uh, is stabilizing uh, the cider so that it doesn't re-ferment with, with, with some sugar in there, whether that be a natural sugar or whether that be um, a sugar that's been added back. And again, I don't think that's, that's nothing. Um, uh, and, and, and you heat it to kill off the, the yeast so it doesn't convert the sugar into alcohol. So it could it come, come a little bit from that, but sometimes you do get these sort of really toasty caramelly characters just sort of come naturally through the um, through some of the phenolics sometimes. So what do you think out there, people? Look, we've got Italy, Magdalena, good evening. We've got Dorset. Where else have we got? We've got a whole world, Somerset, Joel, Canada's in the house. Who else have we got? David Sachs, New Zealanders watching. Look at this. What time is it in New Zealand? Crikey. I'm going to pause an interlude here. And we've even got Berkshire. Well, there we go. We've got everyone now. Well, from New Zealand to Berkshire. Here we go. We're going global, people. Plug number one. World's biggest cider tasting. Saturday, 8 o'clock. My Instagram channel. Tune in. Over the course of an hour, and I don't think I can do a minute more because of the regs on Insta. Excuse me. I'm going to be 
doing an, an interview, a little chat with cider makers from six continents, from 22 different countries in the space of an hour to see what cider in Argentina, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, uh, Norway, Luxembourg, London, what they all kind of taste like. It's going to be fun. And indeed, the Basque country, Ion, sorry, how could I, how could I forget? Um, God, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of tribalism going on for your regions today. This is great. Proud of cider where you're from, people. Um, so please do tune in, and I will talk about that again uh, in a little bit. So, so yeah, apple variety, number one, or your selection of apple variety, varieties is the number one important thing when it comes to um, which kind of direction is your cider going to be going down. This one, bold of tannin, little bit of acidity for freshness, very little um, by way of sugar in there. A classic kind of West Country cider. Cheers to you. I'm going to enjoy this. All right, let's move on to cider number two from the box then. And guys, if you like what you see and you're liking this kind of process, we're thinking we might do something like this once a month. So if you like um, this kind of session, this environment and the tasting along, please do get in touch with me, get in touch with Crafty Nectar. Big shout out to Crafty Nectar for being able to put this box together so, so quickly and getting it out there. And from what I gather, a very, very prompt service. Um, it's been amazing. So thanks to Crafty. So give them a shout. Um, if you want more of these, and we'll do another selection with another box next month. Keep it coming, people. Uh, dare I say, although in some places lockdown is starting to ease, the idea of being able to like go to a pub or, or a two-way place in person and being able to yak and to drink this kind of stuff, certainly from the UK context, I just don't think it's going to happen sometime soon. So I think this is going to be the new normal for a little bit longer. So let's keep on doing it. Anyway, right, here we go. Next one. Side number two is from the mothership. It's from Gloucestershire. This is Bushel and Peck. So Bushel and Peck. There's a guy called Dave, David, David Lindgren, even David, I hope you're in. Um, and um, pour away, I'm just going to talk whilst we're pouring. Small producer, new producer. If you make less than 7,000 litres of cider in the UK, let's put that there for everyone's sake. If you make less than 7,000 litres of cider in the UK, um, you don't pay any duty. It's a historical legacy that helps facilitate smaller starter makers to, to start up. And that's where a lot of people do start. Um, but once you, once you break through that, um, that 7,000 litre barrier, then you're into the brave, crazy world of trying to compete with co bigger commercial cider makers. It's not easy. And David's pushing through that boundary this year. Good year for it, David. Nice one. Well done. Um, so please, please, please do support these small independent cider makers by buying lots of their cider from people like Crafty Nectar. And other places too. I will, I will say there are other um, great retailers and merchants for cider too, but obviously... Crafty Nectar is the best. And to their absolute credit, go check it out, craftynectar.com. They put up this cider marketplace, which is which is just a spot where people like Bushel and Peck can place their cider on the marketplace and it facilitates it getting out to the consumers. That's a pretty awesome thing they've done for the good of cider. So the reason why I've chosen this, A, because it's from Gloucestershire, mothership. Um, but it's interesting because again, it's, I'm, I'm focusing, focusing on the apple varieties. Same, same, but different. That first one contained majority dabinet. It had also been matured for a minimum of sort of six months. The old adage is you don't tap the new season cider until you've heard the cuckoo. Who's heard a cuckoo yet? I know a couple of people have. I haven't. Um, but maybe that's because I haven't left this house for six weeks. <laughs> um, but it needs maturation time. Slow and easy. Funnily enough, oh, slow and easy. That's what this one's called. Maturation, length of time, building flavour, building character. This is a really, really important thing for all the ciders that we're going to be tasting tonight. And this one is no different. This cider is a blend of some um, of some tannic apples, but also some uh, what we call dessert apple varieties or some acid driven. So not classic um, cider apple varieties that have been grown for the sole purpose of uh, making cider, but um, a whole range of different apple varieties. So half of the cider that half of, as I say, ciders are normally blends of different apples and even of different batches, different barrels and things. So this is a blend, a combination of four different things. Um, two parts cider apple, um, one with a lot of um, browns and Bulmer's Norman, browns as we had before, the, the zingy fresh. Bulmer's Norman, very, very uh, bitter apple. The other one, Dabinet and Yarlington Milk, two 
utter classic um, Somerset Cider Apple varieties. Yarlington, one of my absolute favorites, but another one with a lot of Dabonet in here as well. But the other component are these eating apples, these, these dessert apples, including <gasps> Newton Wonder, Lord Lambourne, Howgate Wonder, Pitmaston Pineapple, a few Cox's Orange Pippin, Oh yeah, that's it. So yeah, so they're providing not tannin and earthy, but zing, fresh, lightness, etc. So it's a blend of the two. So I, not sure if I've tried this cider. I mean, I've tried Bush and Peck, and I've tried lots of the iterations before. I'm just not sure I've tried this batch. David, have I tried this batch before? Am I about to talk complete bullshit? I mean, I normally do do that anyway, but let's, um, let's see what we get. So for, again, it's pretty dark, but coloration point of view, it's a little bit paler. It hasn't got quite the intensity of tannin, but that's what we would expect. It's been filtered, it's been carbonated, it is bright, it is brisk, it is zesty. <gasps> what do we get on the nose? Swirl away, get your schnoz in, here we go. Oh, it's completely different, it's completely different. That sharpness, that acidity, that green apple freshness, but it's not just that, this, is, this has got loads, this has got some tropical fruit in there as well. What is it, it's almost like pineapple-y. There's a real lovely, um, intense, aromatic acidity and freshness in there. Um, lots of the ciders that are made, um, it, and you know, these, um, these aromatic type apples and these acid uh, driven kind of apples, these are what are prim primarily used in the New World, Australia, New Zealand, large chunks of Australia, um, sorry, USA and Canada, etc. And some people think that, or if you don't have tannin, then it's rubbish. Again, it's, it's, it's different. Getting spirit on the nose, Steve Bentley. Impressive. No spirit in there at all, my friend. This is just, this is the power of what fermented fruit can give you. It's absolutely amazing. I think that's a, a wonderfully inviting nose is getting you in. Yes, I tried this in the freezing barn in January. It was bloody freezing. Back in the good old days when we could, you know, actually meet and taste and um, you had some really nice food on cheese, I seem to remember. Or some cookies, some really good cookies, weren't they? Well done. Anyway, digressing. I have had my dinner, so I shouldn't be hungry. I'm just very, very greedy. Anyway, let's have a taste. Cheers to you all. What's sale? Let's have a go. Oh, that, that aromatic component just flushes right up your nose all the way through your brain and pops out. Fabulous. This is a cider, again, that is a demonstration of balance. Um, having this acidity, having these aromatics, and then just behind a little bit, um, are some of the phenolics that come through from the from the tannic apple. So a little bit of toasty, a little earthy, almost a touch of clovey on this one, maybe. Maybe that's interplaying with some of the acidity. But it's definitely fresher. The the more the more the more fresh component is, I would say, dominating over the more tannic component. But if the tannic component wasn't there, you would notice because it would probably fall away. The cider would probably just be quite light and fresh and just drop away halfway through drinking it it would sort of once it reached the mid the middle of your palate then it would just stop but it keeps going and that's because we need this tannic component but this has been aged um for a, a while and you know that because of the softness of the tannin dabonet is it's a bit of a beast you know it needs it needs time to mature and this again think about wine think about something that's bold of tannin you know I'm not saying that if you age a cider for, for eight years that it's going to improve over that period of time. No, hasn't got the alcohol, hasn't got the tannic structure. But what we are saying is that, that there is a period of maturation that will enable this cider to improve its character, improve its structure, its smoothness, its complexity. Babinette can still be quite <laughs> rabbit punchy um, after six months, even after a, even after a year. Um, you know, sometimes after two years, then it's kind of good to go. But this is the smaller cider maker's problem. Although they're making cider ostensibly in the same way as they're making wine, they don't get the price per litre that wine does. And they can't compete with beer because although um, the price point is similar to beer, beer can knock out once a month. These guys are making their cider, but once a year, they are vintage cider makers. So cider makers, smaller cider makers are often caught in between these two drinks haven't quite got the the value of wine haven't quite got the volume of beer it's my personal opinion that a drink of this quality should uh be charging and be receiving a considerably higher price than it currently does because of the time the effort and the skill 
and the cost of the raw material that goes into it, margins are really, really tight. Um, some people regale against the term fine cider or have a real issue if a cider gets put into a 750 ml bottle that presents itself a little bit white, like a wine. I, I understand maybe why there are some concerns that, you know, cider doesn't have to be doesn't have to be sort of poncy or wanky in any way. And it doesn't. But I do think that by doing things like that, it helps those drinks to um, to receive the value that they absolutely deserve. And so I think this is a, I think this is a fantastic cider and I would quite happily drink this quite a lot of time. What do you guys think of this? Do you like this cider? Um, lots of lovely people coming in um, to say hello tonight. Thanks everybody for turning out Thursday night. Oh. I think we had a few questions that I missed whilst I was yanking on. Joel, evening Joel. What's the most unusual note that you've ever found on the nose of a cider? Um, butane gas. <laughs> but that's more of a fault than a particular character. Um, I tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a little, I'll tell you a little story. How about that? Whilst we're just nursing this one for two minutes. It's not actually, it's not actually an aromatic character that came from the fermentation. I lived in New Zealand for a while. I made cider for um, for Peckham, who are in Nelson. Um, they're going to be with us on the world's biggest cider tasting Saturday night, eight pm. Instagram, tune in, people. Uh, but I lived in Wellington for a few years as well, for a year. Sorry, um, I lived on on Victoria, uh, on um, uh, Mount Victoria. Gosh, this cider is lovely, and I'm getting distracted. Mount Victoria, which is what these amazing pine trees. They did, did a lot of filming for uh, Lord of the Rings. There, remember the scene when the when the uh, when the hobbits are hiding under the. Uh, the roots of the tree when the ring wraith goes over the top that was literally 100 yards behind my house amongst all these pine trees they had to actually put in that oak tree pretend oak tree for the filming anyway i digress um and there was a, there's a tiny little cider maker in in wellington steel press cider they're really good and uh, i got the opportunity to go to the new zealand cider festival last oh was that last year was that two years ago where are we in november 18 months ago and they had this um, cider like uh, ma maple and pine it was called and I poured it and the smell reminded me of, li of living in my house in Wellington I just I just I don't know brought back an emotion a feeling that was quite a tumultuous time for me I was uh, I was in a period of change in my life but Wellington's the most incredible place and New Zealand's fabulous but I was thinking of moving back and so it's quite emotive um, and that smelling that cider just took me back to that place. And the time I was like, wow, this is amazing. The pine needles that went into the cider to, to, to give some of that sort of piney character were picked from those very same trees behind my house. So the, the potential for just aromas that have a really visceral and emotive response, um, I think is fantastic. It's a bit like anybody who's got a particular piece of like music that takes you back to your first love or, you know, being heartbroken or the best time of your life or a challenging time or, you know, those things, the perfume of a, of a, of a flame, you know, a form of flame, etc. It's one of those same kind of things. It's, it's really, I find it absolutely fascinating the way that our, our limbic system in the brain builds up um, these different characters. Anyway, that was a bit of a, a ramble. Um, mangoes and pineapples. Mango. Actually, I think mango is even better than pineapple. It's that, it's that slightly rich sweaty that's what it is um there are certain marlborough um sauvignon blancs um the majority of the marlborough sauvignon blanc that you get over here is really really green so sort of green pepper um it's not my personal taste um where i lived in nelson they make sauvignon blancs that have got more of a sweaty oily kind of character to it and that yeah that really really ripe mango kind of comes out and i think that's definitely a little bit more of what we're getting here. So, very, very good. Well, uh, check out Bushland Peck. What other information have I got? Um, these come from all these, um, the, the, the dessert apple component comes from lots of some little gardens and orchards from all over Gloucestershire, Longney, Toddington, Winchcombe, Armington, Northleach, Charlton, Kings, etc. Um, I love it when cider makers give me loads of info, it gives me lots to talk about, so I have to just bullshit as per normal. We haven't talked about yeast particularly. Uh, in this, um, David utilizes a cultured yeast in the uh, dessert apple component to sort of accentuate the, the fresh characters and the aromatic estuary characters. There are select yeast that you can use, like we would in wine, that enhance the aromatic characters. 
David then tends to use more wild yeast fermentation on the on the tannic apples just to allow them to slowly build their phenolic characters and maybe not drive off too much of the aromatic component. Again, not better, not worse, just different, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a really big advocate of cider makers talking about, you know, obviously in person, but whenever somebody buys a bottle, they're not there to buy, you know, to speak upon behalf of their product every single time. Um, and but so as, I'm a big advocate of putting as much information on the label as possible personally, but that's just me. Question from Robin, is yeast more important than the apples? I would say no. The apple varietal is absolutely key and fundamental. The selection of the yeast and of the process and the methodology that you then undertake, undertake means that you can get very, very different interpretations of where that variety is planted in the world, uh, the terroir, or then maybe what the vintage characteristics are year on year. But the apple varietal or varietals, those are the, that's, that's the number one for me. And then, and then you can go down, that's how you get the differentiation. This is described as medium. Oh, hang on. This is described as medium. Do we know what it's been back sweetened with? I suspect it's back sweetened with some sugar. And you know, the description, this is one of the things that I, uh, you know, that so often, the only descriptor, the only term that we have for cider is dry, medium or sweet. Well, all that really does is tell us whether it's, you know, dry, medium or sweet. That doesn't tell us how it tastes. You could say that, um, well, the first two are a little bit different of sugar content. But if you've got two ciders got the same amount of sugar in, but have got completely different apples, they're going to taste completely differently. So you can't just dry, medium or sweet. It's not the sole common denominator um, that is going to be able to identify that, which is why I'm a big fan of increased language. And once again, gratuitous plug number two, if you read Ciderology by Gabe Cook, available now, Amazon, you'll find that I do try and talk about language and stylization. And this one's a bit of a, a bit of a half and a half, I suppose. We've got the West Country component and what we call an Eastern Counties or a modern kind of element in there with that acidity. So it sits somewhere in between. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a... Um, it's a little bit of a, of a grey area because there's different because there's no rules about what is dry, medium or sweet. There is everyone's got a slightly different opinion from their own personal palate. And then it's the interaction of the tannin and the acid and the sweetness as well that comes into it. I think I saw. Let's just double check. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Mr. Albert Rickson is in the house. If you don't know Albert Rickson, um, then where have you been all your life? Because he is a, a cider stalwart. He's a true country gent, and he's a very good friend of mine. Albert, good to see you, my friend. I'm surprised you've managed to work the technology. This is amazing. Or that you've got internet in Minchinhampton. This is fantastic. Well done. Rob Castle from May Hill, part of Perry Country. I'll be tasting a Perry tomorrow night. If you want to know about Perry, um, tune in tomorrow. It's something that I'm particularly passionate about because it's something that's very strong and very local to where I'm from in Gloucestershire. That's right. Dimmock is... Very, very close to the epicenter of Perry in the UK, which is, um, which is uh, Mayhill. So I've just been distracted by, have you ever tried to make bread, make bread with cider yeast? I haven't. I thought it said, have you ever tried to make cider with bread yeast? And I was going to be a bit rude, but I'll, I'll take it back. Alan Jones, I've got a sourdough starter on the go made with cider leaves. People, we, the sourdough craze is happening. My wonderful girlfriend, Jules, she has just nailed um, the sourdough, what can I say? I am very happy and I'm certainly not going to lose any weight in, um, in lockdown because we're just eating fantastic homemade sourdough. So that's really interesting. We'll have a go on that too. Um, anyway, right. I'm going to have a final swig and ping a couple of questions up. Well, quick questions. Sometimes, you know, I, I lived in New Zealand for quite a while and sometimes I get the New Zealand accent on the go. Um, any questions? Pop them up on the screen just whilst I'm finishing cider. Oh. We've got, um, oh, good evening, Ben. Cheese and cider discuss. Oh, crikey. There's a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole episode to talk about that. What I would say actually is not this coming weekend, but the following weekend, check it out. The I think it's called the Great British Cheese Weekender, 8th to the 10th of May. And it is a celebration of British cheese, speciality British cheese. And I think um, two very fine gentlemen, Selim and Sam, 
and Mr. Felix Nash uh, from the Fine Cider Company. They're going to be doing a cider and cheese matching session. I might be doing one myself, actually, with my good friends Dom and Lara from Two Belly in Bristol. Um, it depends on the cheese or it depends on the cider. Yes, you could just say cheese and cider. It's not quite as simple as that. If you've got a real big, hairy, tannic cider and a really big, hairy, bold cheddar, well, you know, that's just a match made in heaven. Yeah, the sight of Mr. Albert Rickson at any event, Bath & West show, what a shame, we haven't got Bath & West, of Albert sitting, mon repose, leaning on the edge of his chair, sort of defying gravity with a, with a very opaque brown cider and a, and a slice of cheddar that you could, you know, build a house with um, is something that gives me great comfort and I'm sad that I'm going to be missing that this year. What product do you use to get your moustache so pointy? Uh, it's called Captain Fawcett's Moustache Wax and it comes from, um, I think it comes from Kings Lynn or Great Yarmouth in, in Norfolk. That and a natural, uh, you know, zest and spunk for life, obviously, Ed, thank you very much. Um, but obviously, lots of wax. Um, right then, okay, let's move on to our side of the fine, crikey, final side of the ceiling. I'm so excited. We've had loads of people tuning in tonight. This is really, really awesome. Thank you all so much for taking the time. Final cider comes from, well, uh, this is one of the UK's best, what can I say? Very dear friends, very, very talented cider maker. This comes from, this comes from Hallett's. Now, I reckon that if you're a cider fan in the UK, good evening, Lee Reeve from Japan. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you. It must be very, very late in the evening or very, very early in the morning. I'm not quite sure. Uh, my boyfriend wants to look like you and is growing his moustache along with his side of knowledge. How long did yours take? Far too long. Several years, I hope. Uh, the moustache, not the knowledge. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, the moustache took five years and the knowledge took 15 years. So take your pick. None of a, a quick win. Anyway, Alex. So um, Andy, Annie uh, and Andrew are fabulous cider makers. South Wales. Um... Um, Hafadronis, which is near Crumlin, which is near Pontypreeth. Uh, on top of a mountain, I, I, I do mean on top of a mountain, and they've got two pizza ovens, a shop, maybe Wales' largest licensed pub, a bothy, like a little sort of shed, and beautiful, they're just special people who make special ciders. Um, if you've never tried a Hallett cider before, please do. Funnily enough, good choice just plug number three, they appear in Ciderology as my favourite and best Welsh um, cider maker. I just, I just, I just love everything that they do, and their and their attitude. It's absolutely great. They really transcend this balance between super traditional, but also being really quite modern in the process and thinking. And he's an engineer, and so obviously he has to over tinker everything. There are some simple ways, and there are super engineered ways. But hey, when cider tastes this good super engineering obviously works um bit of information about this dun, 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 is again same same but different this is a mud, about 50 percent of dabinet and an aged dabinet a year aged for a year and that goes through a malolactic fermentation a mal sorry before i get onto malolactic fermentation let's have a taste cheers what's we'll to you all thank you again for turning up i'm such a good time um Let's, you know, let's not rush off anywhere. So, Norman Stania's in the house. Big up, Norman Stania. Hello. Okay. Woof. Lots to talk about there. Anyway, I needed a swig to wet the palate. Hang on. To wet the whistle. Um, malolactic fermentation. So, apples um, contain malic acid. That's the natural acidity. Even our... Bold tannic apples like Dabonet will contain at least some, a little bit of, um, of acidity in there. But there are certain kinds of bacteria um, that if you manage the process well without utilising too much sulphur dioxide, um, converts the zingy, crisp, fresh malic acid into soft and smooth lactic acid, so malolactic fermentation. It's not always super easy to, uh, to, to control that in a way such that it gives you softness without going sort of too cheesy or too yogurty. So there's a skill to that, like a delicate touch. Um, so having an aged dabinet, that's our common denominator. Same, same, different. Um, 
Dabinet and Thyme, then blended with a mix of some cider from last year's harvest. So some slightly brisker, fruitier cider to give a bit of intensity. So we've got a bit of smoothness, we've got a bit of briskness. Um, and as Annie Hallett pointed out, this cider has won many awards over the years and is very popular in Canada and Russia. Who knew? So, you know the drill, give it a swirl. Hello, Chris Fairs. Everybody, we have the world's foremost authority on um, of West Country Cider Apples joining us this evening. Chris worked for Bournemouth for, for nearly 50 years. I think it's more like 44 years, but let's not be uh, too picky. Um, and has pretty much taught everybody what they know about growing these tannic apple varieties like Dabinet. So good evening to you. Ben Culpin as well from uh, Apple County in Monmouthshire, another fine uh, Welsh cider maker seems to appear on the TV like every other week, Saturday Kitchen, all the time. And a particular favourite of uh, uh, the, I can't remember, the Dabinet or the Vilbury or the Yarlington Mill um, uh, is uh, is a big fan of Pete Brown's, the uh, the award winning beer and cider writer too. So if you've never checked out Welsh cider before, then do. There's some amazing cider makers. Obviously, we've got. Uh, uh, we've got Hallett's tonight, and we've um, we've got Apple County as well. We've got people like uh, uh, Jaspel's up on uh, our Angle C2, Palmer's Upland Cider, my good old friend um, uh, Steve from uh, Rosie's Triple D Cider from up on again on top of a mountain near uh, near Wrexham. There are some amazing ciders being produced in Wales. In fact, another plug. It's around here somewhere. I think it's in here, isn't it? I'm a joint. Uh, co-creator of something Full Juice. Now you might have seen or heard of this. It's a magazine. It's a magazine to try and champion cider, make cider look cool, talk about cider, enjoy cider, etc, etc. Um, it's, um, we started it myself, Pete Brown, Susanna Forbes, Little Pomona and Bill Bradshaw, award-winning cider writer and photographer. We created it pretty much a year ago to the day the very first edition came out and we wanted it to be a free publication paper that sat in pubs that people could read, enjoy, and become enthused and more knowledgeable about cider. We were just about to release our next edition. But sorry, the reason why I take this, there's a whole thing about Wales in one of these episodes. I think it is this episode two. And we do still have copies. Here it is. Wales, Wales, Wales. Episode two of Full Juice. We still do have quite a number of back copies. If you're interested in back copies of Full Juice, message me or Google Full Juice. It's like fulljuicemag at gmail.com. Send it out there. This is definitely going to be a, um, a little project for us. But the next episode of Full Juice uh, was due to come out right now. But obviously because of Corona, um, we haven't, we, we, we're not going to be able to print it and be able to distribute it. So we are going to post it online for everybody to see and access. This is something that we were thinking about anyway. And so, um, yeah, we're gonna give it a go. So check out uh, fulljuicemag.com. I think that's the website. If you Google Full Juice Mag, you're gonna find it. It's the only one. Um, and our latest edition, which I think is our best yet, we just seem to get better and better, is gonna be as a PDF on the website. So it's not. It's gonna be like may, maybe a touch clunky or whatever, doesn't matter. The fact that we've made it, it's out there. Some amazing writing from, well, not a little bit from me, but from, from Bill, some great stuff, uh, and some contribution from some new writers as well. So full juice, go check it out. I'm gonna stop distracting myself and come back to the Hallett Cider. So, amazing cider scene in Wales. And I say, um, the guys down at Hallett's are, are genuinely great, great friends, friends of mine, and they're making great ciders. And again, they play this interplay between control and kind of letting things flow and complexity. They kick things off with a bit of a wild fermentation, just for a few days, just to get a little bit of character. Then they introduce some culture juice for some control to give some of the direction as well. I know for a fact that in this cider that they utilize a little bit of brown sugar as well. And so if you give it a swirl and get your nose in, there's a definite, you've got a combination of a bit of just good old earthy funk, but clean funk, you know, kind of like, James Brown funk rather than like Parliament funk. <whistles> Not going crazy, just complexity. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, but with a little bit of that real richy kind of toasty character. Gosh, you know, cider's often positioned as being, you know, it's just a summer sun drink or just like a real thirst quencher. Man, this is a fireside drink. This is, 
you know, this is in the smoking jacket, this is a wingback chair, this is in front of the fire, which I wish I had on this evening because it's freaking gold. Um, you know, this is all about richness, boldness. I'm so glad that I took this out of the fridge um, like an hour plus ago because it allows it to really kind of warm up, almost treat like a bloody brandy or something. Allow these rich phenolic, these uh, real sort of toasty rich characters to come out. Anyway, let's have a taste. Our final taste for tonight, ladies and gents. Cheers to you. And what do we get? There is a hint of acidity. Maybe in that blend of new season fruit. Maybe there's a Browns or a Frederick, which is a Welsh apple variety. Something that gives a little bit of zing. But actually, the carbonation helps with that. When you carbonate a cider, it helps to lift it and to sort of balance against sweetness and tannin. But also, carbonation, carbonic acid is, 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 an, is an acid. It's not huge, but it just helps to give a little bit of life against the... Oh, it's, just, it's just so big and unctuous and smooth, but not cloying. Yes, there is some sweetness in here, but it's just rich and it's... Well, it's so enjoyable that I'm going to pour myself a little bit more. Um... It's a great cider, ladies and gents, you know, and, and, you know, a, a big, a big thing for me. Uh, yes. And, a, and there is a little bit of spicy bitterness in there as well. You're absolutely right. And that's helping to cut through a little bit of the sweetness, Steve. I love the branding, the cleanliness, the simplicity. I personally really like these old school, taller, um, 500 mil bottles. They just look a bit, they're just a bit more sort of retro. And, you know, obviously the taste is is crucial. You have to have a cider that's got an integrity um, of taste profile. If it, what's the old phrasing? You can, you know, polish a turd or dress up a turd, but it's still a turd. This is very much not a turd. Um, you know, the proof is in the taste. But by producing something that does have an appeal in terms of its aesthetics, that's going to draw people to it. People are going to be people who aren't cider heads already. The the win, everybody, from a cider perspective, now going forward, is not trying to. It's not cider makers squabbling over, uh, you know, the current cider drinkers who gets what share. Maybe if we brought across 10% of beer drinkers who currently didn't drink any cider at all, if we could get some of those in there and introduce them to the fact that cider maybe is a bit different to what they appreciated or thought that it could be, it's ciders like all the ones this evening, clean, fresh, presentable, dynamic, fruity, characterful, matching with food, drink it on its own. They're just so versatile and they're so tasty and they're so bloody different. We have three ciders tonight that place an emphasis on maturation, that have a bit of an element on dabinette in there and they couldn't be more different. You know, yeah, okay, they're still cider, a bit apple I suppose, but man, you know, you go back through now and have a little sip of each one in turn and they could not be more different because it's how you use the apple varietal. It's the cider making process, an ideology that you then come into it, wild juice or cultures. Do you, um, you know, mature in steel or oak or how long do you age it for? Your, pr your processes, they're, they're so manifold and so different. It all just depends on what you want to do. This is the joy of cider and what keeps me interested after, you know, drinking a lot of cider over the course of, of 15 years is that every single, every single year it's slightly different. I'm going to have a drink. Although this is, you know, Hallett's primary brand, it will taste different every year because these apples grow under different conditions every single year. You know, the same, the same Dabinet apple trees that are being grown in Herefordshire or Monmouthshire, um, I've finished them, I should have got two cases. Next time, you're very thirsty tonight. What's your favourite from the three tonight? George, Poole. Um, I'm going to say the Bushland Peck. I mean, close run thing. I think they're all. I think they're all brilliant. Harry's is just the, the classic epitome of good, clean Somerset cider. That's exactly what I want from a Somerset cider. I want that bit of acidity in there. The Hallets is just fucking gorgeous. And you know, if I was with Hugh Hefner, this is what I would be drinking. Um, but I, you know, having the the time that I've spent in Places like um, like the USA, the Pacific Northwest, and up in sort of New York State and places. I just love the aromatics. I, I, re I really like aromatic white wines. Simple as that, really. I like Riesling. 
I like uh, Gewürztraminer. I like Pinot Gris. I like Gruner Veltliner. I like aromatic kind of drinks. So it's got the aromatics, it's got the freshness, but it's also got the structure behind it too. It doesn't just sort of fall away. It's not just thin or light. A really, really clever blend. Um, so my personal preference out of those three is the Bushland Pet. But there's a reason why I, there's a lot of ciders that I could have, I could have um, chosen for, for this box. Um, there is a reason why I have chosen these ones because I really do think that they are fabulous exponents of what cider can be. And are great demonstrations of, uh, 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 again, of, of that breadth, and breadth variation. So yeah, the vintage char characteristics too. Every single year, the apples from the same tree will, pre will present slightly different characters. Still the same apple variety, same raw profile. But maybe it'll be a bit more bitter, or a bit more astringent, or a bit more fruity, or a bit more spicy, or a bit more earthy. Um, and so again, when, when a consumer thinks of a cider as being like a beer, identical every time, it's not always easy to achieve. Mother Nature is actually trying to, um, is trying to change things every year. So some cider makers, especially bigger, where you've got a brand, try to shoehorn things back to being a bit more consistent. Nothing wrong with that. That's often what the consumer kind of demands. But some of the challenge is that, you know, cider makers want to try and give something that a human consumer will expect, but also um, honoring and celebrating the diversity that you have um, in, in, every, in every kind of given year. So there we go. Keep these questions coming in, people. We've just gone nine o'clock. We've been going for just over an hour. Um, this class hasn't been finished yet, so let's let's keep going through. But as I said, this is only part one of two. How awesome is that? If anything, to, I, I, tonight was going to be like the the simple, easy night. I was wondering whether I was going to have enough stuff to say to fill this night's session. I should not have doubted my ability to talk side of bullshit for such a long time. Um, uh, but tomorrow night, we are trying... <gasps> Line down, medium, line down, small producer from Herefordshire with a very long pedigree that lots of stories to tell you about there. Tigwin, uh, right on the uh, Herefordshire, uh, Monmouthshire border. Uh, was it Gwent border? Hmm, not sure. Welsh border. Let's go for that. Um, single variety, Kingston Black. Let's try a cider that just has one apple variety. And then finally, ah, we're going to try a Perry. Uh, from Once Upon a Tree, who are based in Lebury in Herefordshire, but four miles from Dimmock, which is just over the border into Gloucestershire. I knew I'd get another Dimmock plug in. Uh, I'll be talking more about Dimmock tomorrow because of the Perry um, and Stinking Bishop Cheese. If you're a fan of Stinking Bishop Cheese, tune in tomorrow because I'll tell you some fun stories about that. Um, but yeah, what a great start. I've really, really enjoyed this. Keep, keep any final questions coming in, otherwise you're just going to get to see me drinking cider for the next five minutes, which I'm perfectly happy with. That's really good. Oh, for amateur cider makers, what would you propose for cider making processes? Keep it simple. If you're going to do one thing, do this. And I knew that somebody, I knew it would come to hand. I've always got it here. By the Bible. Oh, I don't mean the Bible. I mean, obviously, the cider Bible. The good doctor, Andrew Lee, First produced his uh, craft cider making book about 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. It's on its third editions. Um, it's on its third edition. Um, and it's just, it's brilliant. Every cider, every smaller cider maker around the world that I've kind of visited or worked with or worked for, including Peckham's in New Zealand, this sits in everybody's drawer because it sets out so very easily the fundamental aspects of cider making. If you do this right, you're going to go 80% of the way to making a really, really good cider. And if you do this and you do this and you do this, these are the considerations and how it will impact upon it. It's kind of like a little bit scientific, but it's very, very accessible. And it's just perfect for anybody who's making like 200 litres, up to 200,000 litres pretty much. Buy it, Amazon, 15 quid. And Dr. Andrew Lee um, is, a, is a bit of a legend really. Uh, he's an awesome dude. Um, and a lot of good fun. So that's what I would do for anybody um, who's looking to, to start some cider making do that. Just whilst if there's any final questions, oh here, does glass variety and colour make a difference? Opinion on cans, gee whiz. Uh, glass variety, so glass, so with, with beer, almost exclusively, you've got amber glass. Ironically enough, not for Corona beer. Mm. Anyway, I'm not conspiracy theorist like a 5G kind of person, don't worry. Um, there's a reason why you've got amber glass and beer. It's because of uh, 
uh, a fault that can develop if light comes into contact with hops. It's called um, uh, light strike, and it can produce quite some quite stinky, funky kind of characters. Cider doesn't have that. Potentially, I suppose, if cider was placed in a, in, in a window for a long time, you might start to gain some oxidization. I don't really think that's the case. So it's down to personal, personal preference. The cans, again, maybe for uh, keeping and intensifying some of the some of the aromatic characters, possibly it's beneficial. You've got to be careful about the amount of sulfur dioxide. Very boring te kind of technical things here. Personally, cider is great and has so many. Um, it's got so many different options available to it that it's up to the cider maker to decide how they want to present it to the consumer. So often, it's more of a consumer decision. If a consumer sees, if a craft beer drinker sees um, a, a jazzy looking cider label in a three thirty or now a four forty mil, funnily enough, that we come back round can they might be appealed to it just because of the boldness and the vibrancy of it not even necessarily because of what's inside so it depends to um on the cider maker as steve said uh, the halitz is available in cans doesn't it isn't it will be the same liquid different pack format endeavoring to try to appeal to different kinds of consumers absolutely so you know where you are on saturday night i'm going to really bore you with this but Join in. It's called the world's biggest cider tasting session. And obviously I've made it up like I make up most things. Um, just help with the beans on toast. Hooray! Oh, I'll go to bed easy tonight. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to get as many people from around the world watching me talk to 22 different cider makers from all over the globe in the space of an hour. Literally going to have two minutes per cider maker it's going to be chaos but fun but i want every i want everyone to join in and watch and to comment who you are where you are and what you're drinking and afterwards i will endeavor if i have the time if i'm not too hungover to count who we have watching to um to see um to see how many people around the world and then to proclaim a world record without actually being able to claim it at all um so we'll see. So I forgot to say, uh, Catherine Saint-Georges, uh, hello to you. Good to see you from Quebec. Um, I was supposed to be seeing you um, not so long ago, but Corona kind of got in the way. So Steve Sellens in the house from Ithaca, New York, South Hill Ciders. Definitely a top 10 cider in the US. It's great to see you guys tuning into this. Thank you so much. I kind of don't want to go. You guys are so... Uh, so chatty i might just have to pour a little bit more cider if you keep on asking me questions i might just keep on drinking and talking to you five minutes more max possibly so let's see who continues in but yeah do to do tune in tomorrow for our second part of this talk and taste session um i hope you've been enjoying it um if there's anything else that you need me uh, uh to introduce you to then do let me know oh I'm, I, I've surprised myself by the quality of the ciders that we've tasted the cider. It's, um, it's really heartening to see that even in this, um, even in these uh, challenging times, that the opportunity to be able to, to drink and enjoy uh, fantastic ciders is great. So thanks again to, to Crafty Nectar for being able to facilitate this by the creation of the box. Um, and we know we'll, we'll keep on doing more of these things. Even when we get to like, new normal like normal normal like in a year's time we're going to be doing loads more of this i want to be able to do tasting sessions with people like steve selling over in in, uh, in ithaca is there a 50 50 barry was it dabinet hmj um some people like ross and why i'm sure will be utilizing stuff like that so um how it still only sell, only sells still cider right now this is lightly carbonated so uh um, Catherine, so go check it out. Um, so yeah, I'm going to see you guys tomorrow night. I'm going to sign off. I'm going to hang on. I'm going to not really contribute anymore because you don't need to hang on for me. It's past your bedtime probably. It's only a Thursday night. Stay up late tomorrow night though, won't you? Friday night party. Um, cider pairing for these three. Uh, cider pairing for those three. What food or cheese? Man, I'm gonna to need to have to have a little bit of a think about that. There's a lot of different, a lot of different things going on there. Um, it's my favourite variety of apple. I do like Yarlington Mill from a talent perspective. 
dim it red because you know I have to, and because it is the finest bit of sharp apple available in the UK. Uh, golden russet is my favourite kind of more acid driven apple. It's just so aromatic. It's amazing. Um, can grapples, can crab apples be used in cider? Yes. The question would be why. If you wanted to get some tannin and you didn't have access to West Country apples, then um, then crabs can provide a bit of a source of apple. Um, some of them are much more just pure acid. Some have got some acid and tannin. Um, um, so yeah, have, have it's all about playing and experimentation. Virginia Clare, my favourite cider. Pfft, can't answer that. It's too many. There's too many ciders in the world. I'll say about cider makers, Ross and Y, Tom Oliver, these guys presented, you know, tonight. My man, uh, the Angry Orchard um, Cider, you know, Innovation Cider House up in Walden, Big Hill, Plowman's, Alpen Fire. There's a whole world of cider out there. Basically, a lot of the people who I'm including on the world's biggest uh, cider tasting, Peckham from New Zealand, Willie Smith from Tasmania, Australia, just incredible. Mr. Chris Fares, some winemakers mention old vines on label. Do you think old trees on a cider label is valid? Yeah, I think I really, I really think that it's incumbent upon the cider maker to advocate what is in their product and why it is different or better, if that's the terminology they want to use. But don't rely on the consumer just going to know that your cider is 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 going to be better because of the because of of anything other than what you tell them it's going to be and i think there's a lot of very anecdotal evidence to suggest that um it, by utilizing fruit that comes from older trees those trees are putting much more effort into the fruit rather than into growing so potentially there's a greater flow of uh um you know of of, of phloem and of ions and things to provide some sort of more intense flavor kind of characters rather than just sort of going into the growthy kind of stuff What's the cider from Ross? It's Ross and my cider and Perry Company. Anything from them, I think you'll find is is quite an experience. The cider of universe is huge. Is there an Austri is there an Austrian cider maker? Can never find proper cider on holidays. You betcha. Well, there's a little bit of uh, of most, but what they are famous for is their Perry. Actually, the most fertile uh, in the sort of northern part uh, uh, of Austria is a big valley where they make a huge amount of. Um, Perry up there, quite lean, quite acid driven, a bit like a sort of dry lean Riesling, um, quite different from what you might be expecting from a, either a West Country style cider or maybe even an Eastern Counties style of cider. So, yeah, it just all kind of depends. All right, ladies and gents, I'm going to call it a day now. Thank you so much for joining in. I hope you had a good time. And yeah, thanks for, for, for sticking around. I will see you 8 p.m. tomorrow night here for uh, our next round. To Gwyn Kingston Black, Line Down Medium, Once Upon a Tree, Perry, lots to talk about, um, even more so than tonight. Who knew that I could talk so much about cider? Um, it's just great, it's just great fun. Thank you so much for joining in. Um, peace out, stay safe, stay well, and yeah, see you tomorrow. And obviously I'll be gratuitously plugging world's biggest cider tasting once again. So. Cheers. Happy Thursday. See you on the morrow.